Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a strange video for me. Um, I'm not used to doing this sort of a thing. I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants, but I've been kind of intrigued by what's been going on with this uh, Rolling Stone rape hoax crap that Sabrina Rubin Erbley has foisted on the rest of the public. And I've kind of noticed a few, and this is all popping up in Reddit, so obviously I'm not going to be the only one making these connections, but I just wanted to sort of point them out just in case anybody's actually missed any of these. Now I'm going to try and uh, play around with uh, Adobe Premiere and see if I can put some little insets up in this area here showing these articles, but I'm just going to describe them in this video and we'll go from there. Uh, first thing that uh, the article that really popped to my mind was one written by Christina Hoff Summers. It was written on January the 23rd uh, of 2015, and it's called The Media is Making the College Rape Culture Worse. Now, in this article, Christina actually outlines how uh, the rape culture meme sort of began. It, it actually began uh, in a 2010 report uh, commissioned by the uh, National Public Radio, or NPR, and the Center for Public Integrity. And it was a small group of investigative journalists in 2010 that investigated uh, sexual assault on campus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they released a report that then uh, spurred the, the Office of Civil Rights. Now, basically the narrative of this report was essentially a whole bunch of cherry-picked statistics creating a crisis. Now, if you do a search or read the article that I'm going to post up there, you'll find all sorts of links to these things. And you'll find a lot of very familiar names, by the way, associated with a lot of these studies. Uh, now, these people actually spread that narrative far and wide. They went to their various and sundry little uh, media organizations and started talking about rape culture and spreading it to other journalists who then took it up as a meme, which then uh, basically prompted the Office of Civil Rights, uh, Reslin Ali, to come out with the now infamous Dear Colleague letter. Uh, this this uh, this report, of course, attacked the the government for not doing enough. So the government, of course, had to then react. So, in the meantime, the thing that kind of went unremarked was that a lot of the people that were featured in this this report, a lot of the people whose stories were featured, were, became prominent and regular and frequent guests at the White House. And this is all outlined in this particular article. Now, moving on to the next article that kind of caught my attention is one by, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name properly, but I think it's Ash Shao from the Washington Examiner. She brought one out on April the 7th, of 2015, which is sort of after the brouhaha of the Rolling Stone article actually came out. And this article is entitled, Few, If Any, Consequences for Those Involved in Perpetuating Rape Hoaxes. Now, this one I found kind of funny because I got into a bit of an argument with a guy on Reddit. And uh, this guy was saying, well, they're just laying low for a while, and then they'll quietly fire these people later. And my contention was, no, absolutely not. In fact, these people are following a agenda. And part of that agenda is to protect those who break the law or act in an unethical manner from any consequences for their actions. This, this gentleman refused to admit that this is a possibility, uh, so I find this just a little bit delicious. Uh, on a personal level, to see all this sort of stuff coming out. Anyway, uh, in this article, Ash says, No one at Rolling Stone is getting fired. Of course, this is not news to anyone. The University of Virginia president, who, who still has consequences uh, on the fraternities, but not the sororities, and the sororities are actually different ways. Uh, I guess the sororities have a curfew. They're not allowed to be in a fraternity anymore. Uh, but... The University of Virginia has put sanctions on fraternities based on this particular report, which has proven to be false, and they're still in place. Not only that, but the vandals of the frat house, the people that have smashed the windows and spray-painted the sides and smeared and, 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 and basically uh, libeled the people that, that live in that, in that house, the people that scared those people to the point where they had to go to a hotel, uh, these these vandals, this vandalism, this act of violence is not being investigated, not even investigated, because uh, it's it's in favor of you know a greater narrative. 
Now, those who are versed in these things, those who have been paying attention for, for any length of time, anybody who's read Casey Johnson's book, will understand that this is exactly the same pattern that had been followed at Duke Lacrosse. And out of this comes the exact same narrative that they are trying to promote, that they tried to promote through Duke Lacrosse as well, excuse me, is that um, well, this proved to be a false allegation. This proved to be a, a false alarm. But, you know, the rape culture is, is, is so important that we really must pay attention to it still. Don't let this, this one falsehood, this, this, this rare occurrence distract you from the greater good. Now, this is exactly, essentially, what Amanda Marcotte wrote in uh, her article for Talking Points Memo of April 7th called Sorry Rape Deniers. And basically what she does is she worries very much that those who oppose the feminist agenda will use this particular story to further discredit rape culture. Well, no shit. It's, it's fake. Everything to do with rape culture has been manufactured from the beginning as we are seeing with the unfolding of these articles. Now, April the 8th also, the next day, uh, Ash Shao comes out with another one. She's, she's this, this, this woman is, is amazing, a Washington Examiner. Again, has the Rolling Stone gang rape author ever corroborated a story? And in which, the base, basically, she details uh, several articles that Sabrina Rubin Erdley, the person that wrote for Rolling Stone, the person that uh, the person from uh, Reddit is is convinced is is simply awaiting quietly the axe when uh, when all the brouhaha dies down. This particular reporter has a history of writing uh, stories on rape culture or rape culture themed subjects. For example, Rape of Petty Officer Bloomer, which is uh, an article that she wrote quite a while back. Uh, which details, of course, the, the rape of uh, a petty officer who woke up one morning uh, after a long night of drinking, and, and and when one of the investigators who was busy arresting her for de for being drunk on duty, uh, when he said uh, something along the lines of, uh, uh, "Unless you've been raped, you're you're in a, a lot of trouble," or something like that, and then all of a sudden she made her her, her accusations. But anyways, uh, I, I won't really get into the story so much. I'll just kind of. This is sort of what happened in this. Read the article. But again, in that article, there is no attempt to, con to contact the investigators of the actual rape accusation. And or Sabrina Rubin Erdley, or Sabrina Rudin, Rubin Erdley investigated but ignored every inconsistency she came across. Anything that got in the way of the narrative that she wished to portray was simply discarded. The Catholic Church's secret sex crime files. That would be another one of Sabrina Rubin Erdley's uh, rape culture narratives. Again, with no indication of corroboration of any of the story, it's all one person's account. And then usually, and the, the other thing that's sort of uh, similar between them, is they're all characterized as being viewed, uh, witnessed personally by the journalists, much like the, the Rolling Stone article. Uh, and also, like all of these articles, they include quite a few unverifiable facts. Facts being in quotations, I suppose. Now, another article came out on April 8th, and this is by a guy named Leon Wolf, and he wrote for a website called Red State. Uh, the title of that article is, Why Does Sabrina Rubin Erdley's Rape Stories Keep Falling Apart? Where he, again, outlines the uh, past mega narratives about or meta narratives about uh, rape culture that have been propagated and uh, uh, disseminated by Sabrina Rubin early and her compatriots in the mainstream media. Moving on. On April 8th, probably a little later on in the day, I would, I would assume, on, uh, on a site called The Daily Caller, a guy by the name of Chuck Ross writes, in his article, How Deep Is This Education Official's Involvement in the Rolling Stone Hoax? In this article, this person details the relationship between Catherine Lamon, who is a assistant uh, to, if I'm not mistaken, I, I didn't actually write it down in this particular notes, but I think she is an assistant to 
uh, Ruslan Ali, who is the head of the uh, Office of Civil Rights. But in any case, this person is the head of the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, Civil Rights Wing. And Catherine Lemon is also designated to the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault. Now, in this article, this uh, Catherine Lemon is quite quite heavily tied to Emily Renda, who is the University of Virginia employee who contacted Emily Renda, or who, sorry, who contacted Sabrina Rubin Erdley and alerted her to Jackie's story. Both Emily Renda and Catherine Lemon were invited to three uh, of the same White House meetings, one of which uh, was conducted by Lynn Rosenthal, who at that time was the White House advisor on violence against women. Both also, uh, by the way, testified before the exact same Senate hearing on uh, campus sexual assault. And incidentally, this is the first time that Jackie's story was recounted publicly by Emily Renda, the person that got Sabrina Rubin Erdley involved to write the story for Rolling Stone to publish. So really what you have here is you have a, a loose connection at, at worst, a loose connection between the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights who, who have issued the uh, Dear Colleague letter that has led to so many civil rights abuses against men in universities through Catherine Lamon and Emily Renda, down to Sabrina Rubin Erdley and the mysterious Jackie. Now the question that I have is how many more of these threads are going to produce more and more information that's kind of interesting to know. I would suggest that those of you who are watching this and that are interested in this particular story dig a little deeper, take some of these names and find out how many of them are connected. My guess is you're going to find that there's an awful lot of them that are connected, and they all seem to lead back to the same place. Now, for those of you who, who think that I'm kind of crazy uh, taking the stance that I do in that there is no way that the government in, in any f form, shape, or, or, or way will actually do anything to help men, I, I, I offer this as beginnings of proof. Because to me, it certainly looks like, through the NPR and through backwards channels, the Office of Civil Rights, which is, by the way, a subsidiary of the White House, of that particular branch of government, if I'm not mistaken. I guess I shouldn't really get into that. Anyways, uh, Office of Civil Rights is obviously a representative of the federal government. The federal government, by or through this representation, in conjunction with the media, has told a lie in order to advance a narrative that is hurting men. Now, is it an oversight? Is it one or two people's ideological blindness? Is it simple stupidity within certain aspects of the government? It is totally irrelevant. Because the simple fact of the matter is this is a perfect example of why petitioning the government for change will never work.